all right so uh, before i start here we uh, i just want to briefly talk to you about your textbook which i've given you the book on symbolic logic okay we would not be able to cover it uh, in the in the course but the idea behind giving you that logic book is that there is a problem in our education system uh, where logic is not being formally taught anywhere okay according to me logic is one of the is the mother of all subjects even maths is you know subject to logic so all mathematics has to be logical but all logic need not be mathematical okay so in, according to me people before we teach students algebra and stuff we should at the same time we should start teaching them logic in a formal way you know what makes a good argument what is a you know what is a premise what is a conclusion okay all these kinds of things so basic so what you should do is so you should take this we won't have time to cover it because it's not part of our curriculum we will not have time to cover it but you should be conscious of this shortcoming which all of us have even i have this shortcoming i've never undergone any formal training in logic which according to me is a flaw okay so you should rectify that flaw on your own okay try to study the first few chapters from this book if it gets very mathematical uh, you know halfway through then you can stop it and then then you can so leave it there and there's another book in the library called introduction to logic it's a white book and it's the same there are three authors and this copy is one of the authors of that book okay so th that book may be also a little bit easier to handle so you can start that and maybe again this is additional extracurricular work that you have to do because it, you have to do your uh, you know business curriculum first obviously but this is something that you should rectify on your own whether during this program or after it okay so a person with good formal training in logic is much better equipped to deal with because in any field that you go into you're going to be dealing with arguments and people will be making all kinds of cases for a particular policy proposal or some measure that should be taken and many of these arguments may actually be flawed they may be logically flawed arguments okay one of the things you'll notice is that there is one of the law mistakes in logic is one of the uh, flaws is there's what we call an ad hominem uh, ad hominem argument okay where uh, what happens is when somebody makes a say Ahmed makes a statement he tries to argue for a certain position so i can't actually counter what he's saying logically so i try to attack him personally i just say oh Ahmed is a bad guy he's immoral and this and that so i'm not attacking his argument but I'm attacking him personally. That is ad hominem. Hominem, hominem comes from you know uh, the name for the uh, the species, the human species. So this is an, one example. You might see this very often in, in happening in uh, in arguments that they don't atta actually attack the person's argument. They attack the person. They say he's this and that. So that's an example of. So these are all things which you should be formally trained in to detect bad logic. Okay into basic structure of an argument so this you should keep in the back of your mind and rectify this uh, deficiency on your own okay because if you have good formal training in logic it's very it's very useful i think and help you to think in a systematic and logical way okay you, you will avoid mistakes on your own as well the other mistakes <coughs> okay so with that little uh, sort of uh, warning <coughs> The funny thing is, even in my uh, LLB course, at least you would think that in a law course there would be at least a couple of more, uh, you know, papers on logic, because it's so important for lawyers. <coughs> but unfortunately, in our LLB courses, if, whether it's a three-year course or a five-year course, there is no uh, paper on logic, not even one paper on logic, <coughs> which, according to me, is a shortcoming because we do teach all kinds of, uh, you know, very uh, subjective material. Uh, but something so important as logic should at least be part of an LLB curriculum and should be actually taught in the schools also. Okay, so <clears throat> let's uh, start with, uh, let's continue this section. So is there any uh, confusion about the uh, instructions on the case? <coughs> okay, so this is how we are going to do your cases. I'll just give you the reading of the case. Uh, I mean, I'll give you the name of the case. You have to go into the folder, extract that particular file and then uh, on, on that particular page number which is given you'll find the case you have to read the case and there'll be a question on the case you have to prepare the question there's no need to prepare ppts or anything when you make presentations you'll just be using the mic and uh, making presentations orally okay and so one thing when you prepare you have to make sure that because you're not going to be allowed to read from something you've written you will have to speak what is called extempore okay so by the only reason you'll be allowed to refer to something written is when you're referring to the name of a case if you're putting up a citation and you're referring to let's say Pasley versus Freeman while discussing Wilkinson versus Downton then you'll be allowed to uh, look up and say okay what's the name of the case Pasley versus Freeman that much that's all that's going to be allowed you will not be allowed to look down you will just have to take the mic and speak freely okay on the whoever I select from the group 
okay so it's going to be and that'll also help you get used to this kind of uh, having to make this kind of a presentation okay so what we'll try to do today is uh, we'll try to finish the theoretical aspects of this uh, of the contract act uh, the material that we need to cover in in the beginning and then some of it we'll cover as we do the cases and so let's uh, <coughs> cover go where we were we were at consideration i think okay we were when we finished we were at consideration okay so uh, just to repeat our consideration okay we gave you some examples so one obvious way to detect, detect consideration is that if i am buying coffee okay and i'm buying coffee for 50 rupees and then i'm giving the 50 rupees that i'm giving to the the st stall owner is the consideration that is this is how we use the language okay so the consideration that is flowing from my side to him is the 50 rupees and the consideration that is flowing from his side to me is the coffee okay but now what will what's going to happen is in many con uh, contractual situations consideration is not going to be so obvious there will be cases where there is consideration but it's not so obvious okay so you have to therefore start thinking of consideration in a more general terms in more general terms as some kind of detriment any kind of detriment or loss that is suffered by any of the parties becomes consideration any kind of even an opportunity loss something that is given up okay something maybe i was supposed to get something but uh, because somebody made me some kind of promise i relied on his promise and i gave up that opportunity to get something okay by relying on his promise so i have given up that opportunity that's also consideration that has flowed from my side okay so it has to be more broad and it has to be seen in more subtle ways consideration will appear in more subtle ways so you have to be aware of that okay that we'll see it as some kind of detriment okay so <clears throat> so why is consideration so important because remember here what did we say what is an agreement if you go back you'll see what is an agreement <clears throat> set of promises forming the consideration for each other okay so this is already giving you a hint that under the common law uh, uh, view of contracts consideration is an integral part of contracts okay so the indian contract act as we said is a codification effectively of the english common law of contracts okay uh, most of it done in 1872 itself very few amendments okay <clears throat> so um, consideration is an integral part so under the common law we say that there is if there is no consideration there is no contract okay so one of the things that uh, <clears throat> you'll see that council will try to do in cases when somebody is trying to enforce a claim under contract one of the strategies that the council has is to show that there was no consideration okay if there was no consideration then there would be no contract so in common law jurisdictions we don't enforce contracts which do not have consideration okay so there are some few exceptions um, but uh, in general con contracts without consideration are not enforced okay but it's different in the civil law countries if you have if you're in italy or germany or somewhere in those countries they don't insist on consideration their contracts can be enforced even if there is no consideration but we are concerned with mainly with common law countries okay so that's why consideration is so important because every promise and set of promises that's how you get an agreement and then uh, there must be they must be the consideration for each other okay so we have a name for contracts which are without consideration we, we have a name for agreements okay which are without consideration which is these are called nudum pactum okay or nudum pacta is the plural okay so if you're referring to one pact that is a nudum pactum okay nudum pactum stands for a uh, bare promise okay so for instance <coughs> if i say if i promise yash that uh, when you graduate from the MBA pro from this PGDM program, I will give you my tablet. Okay. <laughs> so if I make this kind of promise, then at, at the end of the program, when he graduates, I don't give him my tablet. Okay. So do you think he can actually sue me successfully in court? No. Okay. Why not? <laughs> yes. Yes. One minute. Yeah. Yeah. What is it? There is no binding on why why am i not bound i did make a promise didn't i yeah so there is no the problem is that there is no so yash has not given up anything he has not suffered any detriment in return for my promise okay if he had done something if i told him that please help me with the hr conclave okay please take two days off from your free time and help me with the hr conclave which means he has given up his free time he could have gone and had fun he could have you know gone and see a movie whatever so he has given up his free time to uh, help me with the hr conclave then that would be different 
then there is consideration okay and in return for that I'll give you the tablet that would be different but here I'm just making a one-sided promise yeah but sir, under this moving cycle, uh, your consideration won't matter no there has to be consideration from both sides but you are saying that without consideration the promises can be made in Germany and no, yeah, but we are not concerned with those kind. I'm just giving you as a as an aside. I'm telling you, as an aside, I'm telling you that uh, while in the common law countries we insist on consideration, but in the civil law countries they don't. Then I'm just giving you by way of information. But our study is mainly confined to our uh, we are confined to common law countries. Okay, so uh, <coughs> okay, so this is the term that you have learned, which is Newton Pactum, and you will come across this in one of your cases. Uh, that so that's why you'll see that one of the strategies that are that council will have in a case is they will try to show that there was no consideration because if they can successfully show that then the contract will not be enforceable okay so or the agreement will not be enforceable okay so uh, all right so is this is just one uh, so we are still going through the uh, with interpretation clause which is section two uh, there are many elements to the there are many uh, clauses uh, within uh, uh, into the section 2 and we are going through them we still haven't exhausted all of them what we're going to do is we're going to see some of the other clauses in section 2 <coughs> is this big enough I think it's we can make it a little bit bigger okay, no, it's too big all right okay is it visible Yash at the back you can see okay so uh, first is let's look at some differences and as we see the differences as we understand the differences we will get to see uh, we will encounter more of the sub clauses that appear within section 2 okay so the first is okay the first difference that we are encountering is I think it's too loud let's try Okay, let's see how, yeah, I think hopefully this will do the job. Okay, so the first difference that we want to uh, understand is the difference between a contract and a void agreement. Okay, we already saw that when we are looking at, uh, you saw that schema which is there in your calc file, which is that there is a, we can open that once again, just to refresh your memory. So, uh, in the broad class of agreements, you have two subcategories. You have contracts, okay, and then you have void agreements, okay. So the the first distinction that we are going to make is between contracts and void agreements. Okay, so what is the distinction? Yeah, one is contracts are enforceable by law and the void agreements are not enforceable by law okay so that is the first category so you have to understand this this also gives you your kind of your first uh, obvious introduction to taxonomy have you guys heard of this word called taxonomy okay so taxonomy is a word which is used in two ways I should put it into the notes since we are discussing it okay brief discussion of uh, okay, now it's become very small I think now we can make it 125 okay I know why it became small because I've sort of reduced the um, so we'll, we'll uh, what I'll do is I'll just put this back. Uh, I'll just put this back. We'll increase the size once again. Okay, you've already seen the schema now. So, all right. Okay, now this is better. Okay, so I'm just going to introduce this term called taxonomy. Since before we get into this um, differences, uh, you should be aware of this kind of a scheme. Okay. So what I have here is kind of like a taxonomy of agreements, okay? We would say we have a taxonomy of agreements. So the word taxonomy is used in two ways. Normally I introduce this term only when we do finance, but uh, I think it's useful for you, everyone to know about this. Okay, this is the word uh, taxonomy. Taxonomy is actually used in two ways. It could be either the science, you kind of remember something from your zoology, like genus, species, Carl, Carl Linnaeus came up with a system of classification okay like mammals and you know we are like we are classified as homo sapiens the human species okay so this this is uh, part of what is uh, the taxonomy for zoology okay so it's it's used in two ways it's either the science of classification okay or obviously uh, you have to ignore my spelling um, 
take care of okay or it can also be used in the sense of a particular classification okay uh, a particular classification so uh, so the science of classification is also called taxonomy all right so you understand there are certain principles in taxonomy okay which is our general principles of taxonomy which you should follow which is for instance here itself you can see one that when we uh, these are not again these are this is something which i think is a very important subject but it's not covered in in pretty much any subject so it has to be covered separately so this is a taxonomy of agreements straight away okay so one way we use it is we use it to define a particular classification what i've done is i've classified agreements into two types those which are void agreements and those which are contracts okay by saying that one is enforceable by law and one is not enforceable okay so this is also called this can be also referred to as a taxonomy of agreements okay and further down we have subcategories again so the entire thing can be called a taxonomy of agreements okay all right now so this is one way and then the entire science of uh, classification can also be referred to as taxonomy okay so even when you're referring to the science or the discipline of uh, you know uh, classification the, the science or the methodology of classification that is also referred to as taxonomy so there you have certain principles like you can see one of the things which should become very apparent to you is that the categories that you have at any particular level okay the categories at any particular level they should be mutually exclusive you understand you remember from your set theory yes, if a and b are mutually exclusive that means no no a intersection b is null is a null set and no element of a is an element of b right so uh, so that means this is one of the first principles of taxonomy okay which are kind of very difficult to find anywhere but uh, you can figure this out from common sense that the taxa these are called taxa the contracts is a taxa and this is a uh, this is a taxon and this is a taxon as well separately okay and these two these categories should be mutually exclusive at any level okay that is one of the conditions obviously all right so uh, so you've learned a new word taxonomy okay we have to again uh, go and increase the view okay all right okay so taxonomy is used either in the sense of the science of classification the principles of the methodology of classification or to refer to a particular classification so if i take all the students on this campus and i split them up into these are all bcs students these are mcs students these are pgdm students etc that would be also referred to as a taxonomy of web students okay i could also do another kind of taxonomy by dividing everyone into male students and female students that would be another kind of taxonomy of web students okay so that's these this is the way we use the word taxonomy okay so you saw the taxonomy of agreements okay so the first difference is between a contract and a void agreement and both are defined um, in uh, in section 2 itself and these are the particular clauses so you notice i'm jumbling up the clauses okay in line with the earlier system that we followed so uh, i'm jumbling up the clauses but i'm telling you the actual clause in section 2 so when you're looking at uh, this this is an agreement enforceable by law as a contract this is clause h okay so now we have to make certain changes so you have understood the difference between a void agreement and a contract right that one is enforceable by law and one is not enforceable by law okay now we have to there are certain problems in the wording of the contract act which we have to be a little careful when we are discussing because it is not these are not universally acknowledged to be problems okay nobody has highlighted these problems but you will see that they are actually problems when we discuss them so we want to add a few things we want to add a few words to the language of the statute here i put it as uh, i put it under bracket in brackets means these things have been added by me okay these are not there in the contract itself so when we say an agreement enforceable by law as a contract actually what we mean is that it is enforceable in addition i mean we should just make it doubly clear that it is actually here implied that it is enforceable against both parties okay we are just considering simple contracts where there are only two parties okay so uh, when we say agreement enforceable by law is a contract what we imply is that it is enforceable against both parties okay you'll see later why this kind of definition is required because we will come across some contracts which are actually enforceable only against one party okay so uh, so therefore we distinguish this as a contract which is enforceable against uh, uh, both parties okay a void agreement okay if you see a void agreement it is again when we say it is not enforceable by law what we really mean is it is not enforceable against either party this is not spelled out on the statute but this is what we mean 
Okay, because again, this will be required again when we look at another definition to make a distinction between a void agreement and a voidable uh, contract. Okay, uh, because there are certain elements of this definition which may appear to be, uh, you know, applicable to the voidable contract definition also. That's why it's important to be clear: a void agreement is not enforceable against either party. So it's the mirror image of the contract, which is uh, enforceable against both parties. The contract is enforceable, not just not just enforceable, but enforceable against both parties, and a void agreement not enforceable against either party. Okay, so they are mirrored images of each other. Now the voidable contract. See what a voidable contract is, which is defined in clause clause I. I put that word or, or more or others in brackets because we just want to be we want to make it simple and focus only on uh, you know uh, simple contracts with just one party on either side so ignore this voidable agreement for the moment I'll explain to you what that is okay. that is again my own uh, this also I should put in the third bracket okay so avoidable contract what is referred to in the law as a voidable contract which I have said actually should be being called a voidable agreement uh, but anyway uh, so it's referred to in the law as a voidable contract which is uh, is everyone able to read this okay enforceable at the option of one party but not at the option of the other party okay so now you can see why when we were defining contracts as enforceable by law i wanted to be uh, i wanted to make it explicit that it is enforceable by law against both the parties okay that helps us to distinguish a contract from a voidable contract what is being referred to in the statute as a voidable contract because in a voidable contract we are saying this is a contract which is enforceable only against one party but not enforceable against the other party okay so let's look at an example of a voidable the theoretical uh, part is clear now we look at an example, okay? Yeah. So voidable contract and voidable agreements are same thing. No, voidable agreement is a term that I have introduced, okay, without consulting anybody, and it is not there anywhere in the literature. But according to me, this term should have been called a voidable agreement. So we will discuss it later. Let's first read the statute as it is, okay? The terms that they have used, okay? Uh, so let's try and understand. I'll give you an example of this, then I'll come back to that, okay? Because obviously, since it's not something that has been actually published anywhere, yes. Sir, it is not clear when you are using the word agreement or when you are using the word contract. It is it, it is being used interchangeably. Okay, so we can actually make this. Uh, let's make this in smaller font. I'll tell you. No, I'll tell you. Let me make this in smaller font because this is my uh, view. So but I don't want to. Huh? If we say it is agreement, yeah, it is an agreement. so it won't be enforceable by law. Then. No, 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 no. Don't make that mistake. One minute. See, a contract. Let's go back to the uh, the the thing. You know the scheme. You know what is there on the other side. So I don't have to make it smaller. Okay. So, a contract does not mean a contract. Like contract does not mean that it's not an agreement. Okay. So that's why you see sometimes we use the word loan agreement, tenancy agreement. Okay. That does not mean that they are not contracts. Think of yourself. You are a PGDM student. But does that? I mean, let let's take with whole campus. We just call it VIPS. Okay, does that mean you're not a VIP student? No, you're also a VIP student. Okay, but you're in particular, you're a PGDM student. So what we can say is all students who are here are VIP students. So a BCA student is also a VIP student. So when we have made a subcategory, you will anyway have the properties of the larger uh, category. Okay, so a contract is also an agreement. It's not wrong to say that a contract is not an, uh, it's not wrong to say that a contract is, a, is an agreement. It is an agreement okay so you can also define it as an agreement okay it is just that it's a particular kind of agreement which is enforceable by law but it is also an agreement okay so that's what we mean by that okay it's a skill so uh, Chuk, does it answer your question yes okay partly so agree so remember this so that basically if you are a PGDM student, you are also a web student okay you have to uh, identify so those are at different remember when we discussed ratio decidendi under the Glanville Williams in the Glanville Williams article we were talking about levels of abstraction yes. okay so these are different levels of abstraction okay so you do have uh, the property of a so even a void agreement also is an agreement 
okay a contract also is treated it can be also referred to as an agreement and it's a particular type of agreement okay so uh, so therefore uh, don't get confused by that aspect of it okay so why i'm calling it voidable agreement that we'll come to later but first let's understand the language of the statute as it is written so voidable contract enforceable at the option of one but not at the option of the other okay that's why i wanted to specify that a contract without any qualification just a contract which is not a voidable contract a contract is enforceable at, against both parties and a voidable contract is enforceable only against one party is this clear okay that's why i made that distinction in the i uh, made that i in, inserted the qualification on contracts okay so let's look at an example so let's say a girl is get, is getting married and she has been told that she is getting married to a young man okay but after the wedding ceremony she discovers but well, obviously because of the wedding you can't see when everything is covered okay so then in the, after the wedding ceremony she discovers that this is actually a case that happened in india i'm sure it happens a lot okay uh, this was there in one of our family law uh, this was a case we covered under family law while doing our, our llb okay so uh, so this girl discovers that the, after the wedding she discovers that the ma actually the guy is a very old man so she has been deceived okay so she's the victim of uh, fraud or misrepresentation where she was uh, you know it was given it was represented to her that she would be marrying a young man but she has uh, been married off to an old man okay so she discovers this after the wedding so in this case what we say is because we look at one of the ways to look at marriage is to look at it as a contract okay so in india we say under the hindu family law we also say that marriage is a sacrament okay in most religions actually they have tended to look at marriage even under the catholics uh, catholic faith it's very difficult for catholics to get divorced okay because the church doesn't recognize it so uh, uh, and many devout catholics will not don't want to get divorced okay so therefore uh, so most uh, most religions tend to see marriage they want to basically make marriage last forever so they see it as a sacrament of some sort so it, under hindu law we also say that marriage is a sacrament okay but say muslim law is a very good example where marriage is seen as a purely as a contract it's much more like a contract under muslim law than it is under hindu law or, or other kinds of laws okay so marriage is a contract let's look at marriage as a contract so in this case we say that this girl had this this contract now is a voidable contract because this contract was not properly formed where the girl one of the parties was given wrong information actually she was lied to essentially okay so she's the victim of fraud or misrepresentation so in this case the contract will be treated as a voidable contract okay so now if we go back to the definition of the voidable contract and we look at this example of the marriage okay oh by the way guys when you use i see this a lot of students this is like now using the english language nothing to do with the law but as a aside i thought i should just mention it okay many people say okay many people say that let's say yash is getting uh, when yash is getting married mayank will say i went to attend i want to go and attend uh, yash's marriage okay people talk like this right but that's not the right word what you should say is i am going to attend yash's wedding okay so wedding is the event wedding is a event one or two days or whatever wedding is the event that marks the beginning of the uh, marital relationship okay and marriage is a relationship that subsists between the husband and the wife for the duration that they are married okay that they are married okay so uh, just make sure you use the because i see a lot of our students using this kind of uh, making this kind of mistake saying i am going to attend yash's marriage okay if you start attending his marriage he may have <laughs> some problems okay so don't attend his marriage only attend his wedding okay so make sure you use the words correctly okay uh, don't use uh, marriage and wedding in the wrong way so uh, after the wedding ceremony uh, she discovers this okay so this example of this wedding that has happened and this marriage that has taken place okay uh, now we say that this particular marriage contract is a voidable contract okay and so who do you think when we go back to the definition of a voidable contract so we say it's enforceable enforceable at the option of one but not at the other so this one this one is who the bride or the groom for our example bride, bride. bride everyone is clear that it's a bride yes. okay so you have already auto automatically understood the law by your common sense that if this girl has been deceived into entering into this uh, you know marriage this contract is now voidable at her option which means this is no, uh, enforceable her at her uh, uh, at her choice okay at her option which means she is not obliged to end the marriage if she wants she can hold the husband to the promises uh, to the wedding vows okay she can hold the husband to the contract of marriage okay this is clear if she wants to and then but what does it say here but not who is this other here groom. 
the groom okay so the groom cannot hold the bride in this situation to the contract of marriage because the bride has been the victim of fraud or misrepresentation right so therefore here that's what is uh, that is an example of a, it's an example of a voidable contract okay where one party again voidable does not mean that it has to be necessarily rendered void the girl can still choose to remain uh, married okay but if she wants she can go to a court and say that these are the circumstances under which i was married and then uh, she if the court is convinced with the evidence then the court will annul that marriage okay so the court will declare that marriage now it was voidable earlier once she goes to the court and the court declares it then the marriage will be declared void okay she he will annul the marriage okay so that's basically how the voidable contract works okay yeah do we have oh, we can't use the thing because it's uh, yeah so can, can uh, okay yeah no we'll come to that we'll come to that when we look at section 9 uh, it's here uh, what does section 9 say so remember what is a contract contract is a species of agreement okay so coming back to this idea of uh, the taxonomy okay so the way we use another term that we use is let me just um, put this um, we are going to cover it anyway here later on but let me just put it here the one usage that we have okay is uh, genus and species okay this is used in the english language even when not referring to zoology okay so i forget what genus is but genus is a higher category okay and species is a lower category okay so one of the things we say is that a contract so for example what we say is a contract is we say the contract is a species of agreement okay so agreement is the higher category okay so if you wanted to be more uh, you know complete you would say that a contract is a species of the genus agreement okay if you wanted to do it like that so genus is a higher level category and a contract is a species of that this is how we use the language so we just in in, uh, in normal parlance we just say that a contract is a species of agreement if we are saying this what we mean is that uh, uh agreement is a higher category that all and so what follows from this is that this is something we would i think is already there in your notes later on but uh, we can do this um we can do this again So this kind of language you should get familiar with because uh, this will remind you a little bit of set theory, sets and subsets and strict subsets and all those things. Okay. So let's get comfortable with this once we are using the while we are discussing taxonomy. So I put it in the same part. So these terms that we use, genus and species. Species is a lower category. Okay. So we are referring to a, a lower category. So we can say a human being is a species of mammals. Uh, is a species of mammal. Okay. We are there are many other mammals okay gorillas are also mammals okay so all kinds of mammals we are also mammals but also we can say that all human beings are mammals but all mammals are not human beings this is clear so when we say that uh, so get used to this kind of like language uh, and uh, so when we say that a contract is a species of agreement okay when we are using the language in this way you can uh, make e maybe i'll just put it in brackets and say of the genus agreement so that it's kind of drilled into your head what is a species and what is species and what is genus okay so agreement is the genus and contract is the species is a lower category okay just like mammals is the genus and uh, homo sapiens is the species so all humans are mammals but all mammals are not humans okay so similarly here we say that all agreements are all contracts are agreements so when we use the word when we use the expression all con uh, we when we say that a contract is a species of agreement mm -hmm. okay when we are structuring it like this okay what that automatically will mean that it will mean that all contracts are agreements but all agreements are not necessarily contracts okay and you can see the logic for that here all contracts are agreements because they are covered under that line of uh, under the coloring of agreements okay so contracts are also agreements okay but all agreements are not contracts are you following 
I think some people are a little bit uh, confused at this stage. Please make sure that uh, Niyati, are you clear? Okay. Uh, Mahima, is this clear? So get comfortable with the use of the language and what kind of, uh, you know, a scheme of abstraction is refers to, okay? This concept of higher category, subcategories, okay? So we can also say a PGDM student is a species of BIP student. A BCA student is a species of BIP student, okay? This is clear. So all BIP students are not BCA students, but all BCA students are BIP students, okay? So this is the way we use this kind of language. So uh, be comfortable with this. <coughs> and you may see it later on in your notes this expression that all contracts are agreements but all agreements are not necessarily contracts so we looked at a voidable contract okay so you can see here that one of the distinctions you can think about is obviously between so now we'll just describe all these categories contracts void agreements voidable contracts contract which becomes void and then you can think about distinctions between all of them okay you can try to contrast compare and contrast each of them against the other okay so you can see a voidable contract can be contrasted with a void agreement okay uh, you can see the differences okay you can see all these uh, so let's just go through the categories then we look at the differences uh, once again okay uh, so there's another category of contract which is a contract which becomes void okay now uh, I think I've already told you this once before that the expression void contract should not be used in India or, or in the UK okay some of the in America there, there are some uses of this con expression but in the UK and in India we don't use this expression void contract this would be considered a cardinal sin, sin uh, on, you know in, in terms of legal knowledge okay so I stopped using some textbooks uh, because both of them are referring to void contract so you never say void contract you know what an oxymoron is? Yes, sir. Yeah, oxymoron is a word which contains contradictions in itself. So if I say this person is fat, thin, or this person is uh, tall, short, okay. So these are not good examples, but this is uh, so a void contract is an oxymoron because you can see from here what is the meaning of void? void is not, not enforceable by law. Okay. <clears throat> so void means not enforceable by law, and what we should be clear about: not enforceable by law against either party. Okay and then contract is what enforceable by law against both parties okay so you can't have void and contract at the same uh, in the same breath you can't say void and contract in the same breath as part of the same concept because these are contradictory concepts because the contract is not void it's enforceable okay so therefore the correct expression is a void agreement okay the correct expression is a void agreement so you should never say void contract all right so we have an expression though called uh, so one of the distinctions we can make be is between a contract which becomes void and a void co uh, agreement. So let's look at what is a contract which becomes void. We can actually break this up here to understand it better. Now look at the language here. What does it say? A contract. First it says a contract. Okay. Now. Uh, look at this definition of a void agreement does it say a contract here no it says agreement it's particular about using the word agreement one of the things you'll notice in the contract act is this distinction between no the reason I said don't never use the word void contract you will never see it used in the Indian contract act because they have been very particular when they are talking about things that are void okay they have used the word agreement they have not used the word contract okay so you will find that this particular rule is upheld by the contract act so here what do they say now interestingly during void agreement in clause g they were talking about an agreement not enforceable by law but here in clause j they are talking about a contract <coughs> first they start talking about a contract which means they must have been talking about something they must be talking about something which was uh, enforceable at the beginning because they have used the word contract okay and then you look at the language once again it uh, gives you a warning ceases to be enforceable by law when somebody says something ceases a contract ceases to be enforceable by law can you see that it contains within it the idea that at one point of time it used to be enforceable by law because what is the meaning of ceasing that you stop something which used to have which used to be earlier okay a state of affairs which used to exist earlier uh, has now stopped okay and now ceased to exist 
okay so can you see in the language itself it contains the idea that there was a contract okay so therefore there was something there was an agreement which was enforceable by law earlier that's why they're using the expression which ceases to be enforceable that means it contains within it the idea that at one point of time it was enforceable but suddenly for some reason it ceased to be enforceable okay so this you can see from the language itself okay ceases to be enforceable by law once again against either party okay then once it ceases to be enforceable by law then you automatically go back into the definition of uh, void agreement okay because if something has ceased to be enforceable a contract was a contract as long as it was enforceable by law the moment that contract ceases to be enforceable by law we'll see why it happens then obviously it will be basically uh, it will go into the a category of void agreement it is no longer enforceable by law so it becomes a void agreement okay so essentially this contract will become void okay so that's why we use the expression a contract which becomes void actually which um, to be very very strict again i'm using my own language i'm inserting in my language into the contract act really the way it should be written is so when you read it please notice that <laughs> i am using it for you i'm writing it for your your own benefit but you know you should know what the language of the statute actually is these words in capitals do not Con, are not contained in the statutory definition of contract which becomes void okay but to be consistent and to to be consistent in the i hope i don't confuse anybody by what i'm doing so because technically we we cannot say that a con a, once a contract has become void it has to be now referred to as a void agreement okay so that's why i'm saying that a contract which becomes a void agreement but obviously when you go out in public and you discuss your legal knowledge and stuff, stuff like that don't say a contract which becomes a void agreement because they will not understand that okay then if you do that because they will only understand a contract which becomes void because that's all that's there in the statute so you have to be careful when i also have to be careful but i think that these uh, uh, sort of edits need to be made to make it more uh, clearly on uh, you know and to be always to be consistent okay so essentially a contract which becomes void i'm going to put my edits into third brackets so that you know that these are artificial edits which i've done okay so then obviously once it ceases to be enforceable it will become void okay so this is now we are talking about when we are talking about a contract which becomes void uh, we are talking about something which was a contract which is a proper contract it was enforceable by law at the beginning okay uh, and then something happened and it ceased to be enforceable okay it ceased to be enforceable by law and obviously at that time it became a void agreement Okay. but it's a different thing from a void agreement so can you see now the difference between a voidable contract a contract which becomes void and a void agreement okay we'll see this we'll do this little bit later let me just give you an example of a contract which becomes void we'll see uh, the distinction we'll cover it later okay so contract which becomes void if you take an example for instance like if i agree to sell my horse to somebody okay let's say the agreement is to be uh, executed later on okay if we enter into this agreement but then after a few days my horse dies okay so now obviously i can't execute this contract because um, there is nothing the subject matter of the contract is basically that horse has died okay so this is what we call impossibility of performance now it is now impossible for me to perform this contract so this contract is will be treated as a it was a perfectly fine contract at the beginning that we had agreed to sell the horse okay and we had agreed on a price and everything was fine but then the horse dies okay so then this contract this is something this becomes a contract which becomes void okay this contract is now no longer enforceable okay so another example you can think of if, if i if i uh, enter into a contract to sell a house okay and then there is an earthquake and that house is destroyed in the earthquake once again the same problem uh, the agreement was uh, the contract was fine in the beginning it was a contract to sell a house okay like that's how houses are sold right you have an agreement to sell and then you have the actual execution of the agreement but then in between the house is destroyed in an earthquake so then again this will become a contract that becomes void because of something so in the beginning the idea is that it is not void from the beginning okay there is some it is a perfectly fine contract but because of some peculiar circumstances which transpire then this particular contract becomes void because of these circumstances there is an impossibility of performance okay so you can think of another example which is maybe not a good thing to have to think about but let's say like michael schumacher had that accident the famous he had a skiing accident right now he's in a coma 
So um, now, when he's, I think he's out of the coma now, but in, it's still in very bad shape. So let's say if a Ronaldo enters into an agreement with, uh, let's say he moves to Manchester United and signs a five-year deal. Okay. Now after one year, he has a horrific accident in which he loses the use of his legs. Okay. Now he has to be on crutches for the rest of his life. Now. What will happen now? This will become because now they cannot, he cannot be expected to perform because he was hired to play football. So obviously he cannot play football if he doesn't have the use of his legs. So this will again be a contract which was perfectly fine in the beginning. But after this accident, this will become a contract which becomes void. Okay. So these are all examples of contract could become void. All right. So, uh, all right. Uh, yeah, so this is the distinction that we want to discuss. I'm going to just, when you read it at home later on, it's going to be a little difficult for you, but I'm just deleting all the spaces so we can see everything in one view. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, um, all right. So there's a new term that we are introducing here, which is ab initio. Okay. Which is basically from the beginning. Okay. So can you see now the distinction between a void agreement and a contract which becomes void? Okay, what is the distinction? So, uh, a void agreement becomes void due to unforeseen circumstances or the trouble of control. Void have an issue means it is no, 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 no. Right what did you say? Void? What did you say first? The void have an issue means it is void right from the beginning of the. What is which of those is which of these two categories is void have an issue? Void agreement. No. Now, let him answer. Void agreement. Now, we are discussing the distinction between void agreement and a contract which becomes void okay so which of these yeah so don't say void agreement is an issue you have to say void agreement is void ab an issue okay so you have to be very careful because now we are talking in a business context you're not like if you're hanging out with your friends in a cafe you can talk like this but when you're in a uh, when you're in a business setting and you're answering questions you have to be very particular about the use of words you should be conscious of what you're actually saying if you make a mistake, you should correct yourself. I should not have to correct you. Okay. So um, now, so is this clear? Now the void agreement, the distinction we make is that the void agreement is void ab initio. Okay. So it has no existence in the eyes of law from the very beginning. Okay. Whereas a contract which becomes void is not void ab initio. Okay. It was perfectly fine. But because of some circumstances which have uh, transpire, the contract becomes void. Okay. Well, this should not be, I should have actually put it on silent okay because I'm not accustomed to bringing my phone here so all right okay so um, so is this clear the first distinction guys okay um, now ab initio void also is again uh, contrasted with voidable which is remember that voidable contracts like I gave you the example of that uh, marriage that she entered into now in order to declare that contract is just voidable okay it is not void at that stage so she has to take it to the court and establish before the court that uh, she was the victim of fraud and misrepresentation that she was deceived uh, as to the age of the groom and then the court once it is satisfied that the facts are established the court will then annul the marriage at that time the marriage becomes void okay that contract becomes void okay so um, it's not void ab initio once again the voidable contract also is obviously not <coughs> all right so we just cover some general principles of contracts and there are certain sections which i have given you to study for uh, you know related to particular cases and you should also you know just uh, look at all those sections individually all right now let's just look at one more term that we are learning which is consensus ad idem okay there's another term that you should be aware of which is used often in contract law essentially what this means is it's a meeting of the mind it's referring to a meeting of the minds essentially it means that to uh, to use our uh, you know everyday language you can say that it means that the parties must be on the same page that both parties must uh, you know have the same idea of whatever is being agreed to okay that's all that it means consensus added means a meeting of the minds which is basically a, a perfect fit here that people uh, both of them agree on the same uh, and you see this a little bit more of this uh, that all the details this is very important because you are agreeing to certain things so you have to make sure that both parties this is common sense that you have to agree to the same thing 
okay if you see the definition of consent in section 13 you'll see that uh, you'll see how it's connected to consensus addendum see when you say consent consent is defined in section 13 okay you can see section 13 defines consent you can read it here also okay they consent when they agree upon the same thing in the same sense okay you can see this here okay yeah when they agree upon the same thing in the same sense can you see her that there is the idea of uh, consensus added him also here in the meeting of the minds idea is also there in the definition of consent okay so we consent to each other's proposals okay that is uh, also the the idea of uh, consensus added and meeting of the minds okay so you can read some of these sections on your own on uh, and i've given you a hint for set cases three and four when they come around okay and then a um, couple of other things before we get on to section 10 which is one of the most important sections okay now this i was just discussing with uh, some of the people in the class and the in the other class were not clear okay that uh, let's look, look at section 9 okay, this is a very important thing which many people have a misconception about many people think that uh, contracts have to be written down and registered etc in order to be enforceable okay that is not required under indian law okay so here we have um, a situation where uh, you know you you can actually so you can see the st uh, structure of section 9 okay why are promises important because remember once again go back to uh, what did we say once we go back to agreement what is agreement set of promises forming the consideration for each other okay so this brings in the uh, idea of consideration being integral to the contract okay so when you have two pro uh, when you have set of promises forming essentially the reciprocal promises okay easy way to remember it is to reciprocal promises forming the consideration for each other okay and then you have the idea of consideration and the idea of promises okay and then that that's an agreement and if it is otherwise enforceable then it will become a contract okay so that's why if you see here now so we are actually in section 9 when we are talking about promises we are actually also uh, connecting to the idea of contracts okay so you have to connect the idea because these promises if they are there to form reciprocal promises then they are forming the consideration for each other and the contract and uh, the agreement is not otherwise void then it will become a contract so here you can see in section 9 uh, when it talks about promises what does it say it says that promises may be expressed or implied okay so read the section okay so you see the two things express and implied so you see how broad this is okay uh, so when you say when we say words does it imply in writing no because it does not say written words okay so remember always that when there's no qualification then it has the broadest possible meaning if i say only dsb students can't go dsb students can't go to NUS, that means male or female doesn't matter no student can go to NUS. okay so uh, therefore when words words is not specifying it's not qualified by written words or spoken words so that means it includes all it includes written words spoken words everything okay so uh, it can be either an express promise and then uh, here uh, it can also be otherwise done in words so anything else otherwise than in words typically would be action okay and acts obviously you know acts include omissions acts is failure to act okay is also an act all right so it's a very broad definition so in fact it's not even necessary for agreements to be in words that does not even have to be a verbal agreement okay like uh, <clears throat> so uh, what the the point here is that the the existence of a contract can be inferred by the court from the conduct of parties okay so the way people have been conducting themselves over the years people can actually the court can actually infer from that that there was a contract okay that there is an implied contract so for instance if you have like if you have a sweeper who comes here every day he's cleaning the front yard okay you see him doing it every day and then at the end of the month he's being paid some money by the uh, by the institute and there is no agreement as such okay so and then eventually this goes on for many months so then eventually one month let's say he he, he does his cleaning but the institute doesn't pay him 
so he is entitled to sue because he will actually the court will actually look at the conduct of parties and the court will infer that there was an implied agreement here that that he will be paid certain money for doing this okay so it is that is how broad the idea of contracts is okay so that you have to be careful about that uh, it's not something that has to be many because many people feel that uh, uh, you know how is it possible i mean how are you going to prove it so don't confuse the the question of that's a valid question how are you going to prove it in court some people worry even about uh, verbal contracts okay uh, how am i going to prove it in court now that's a separate question how you're going to prove something is a matter of evidence whether you have the evidence or not or whether it can be proved in some other way but that's a separate question when you discuss the question of whether a verbal contract is valid in the eyes of the law okay then you don't confuse that particular question by the question of whether there is adequate evidence you assume that there is adequate evidence in that case the verbal contract is also valid under the law okay so uh, because if the law was otherwise if the law forbid uh, the, the law forbade verbal contracts then even if you had the evidence you would not have been able to enforce it okay so here we have to understand that the law allows verbal contracts and the law even does not require verbal uh, contracts it can be inferred from the contact conduct of parties okay so how you're going to prove that is a separate matter so that should not be confused with the question of what is actually what the law considers to be a valid uh, a means of making a promise otherwise then in words is also okay all right so some other just general points which we have to understand okay before we go on get on to section 10 which is very important that uh, this section 7 which tells you that acceptance must be absolute okay so when there is a like if you, uh, when there is any kind of offer being made remember what what turns a what turns a proposal into a promise acceptance, acceptance right so it is acceptance that turns a proposal into a promise so when but the point is that the acceptance has to be absolute otherwise it does not turn the proposal into a promise okay so uh, so essentially if like say for instance again if we take the example of buying coffee if the coffee shop owner tell, is proposing to me that you know i will uh, i'm happy to give you a coffee provided you pay me 50 rupees as the price of the coffee then i can say yes i accept your proposal but uh, i will pay you only 40 rupees okay so this basically tre gets treated as a what i'm doing is i'm actually making a counter offer okay i'm not accepting his proposal so this kind because i am i have kind of qualified my acceptance it's not an absolute acceptance if he says i'll give you the coffee uh, provided you give me 50 rupees and i say okay i accept your terms that's an absolute acceptance but here what i'm saying is i'm not accepting your terms because i'm <coughs> proposing to lower the price i'm saying i accept your coffee offer of coffee but let's make the price 40 rupees now that's not an acceptance of the proposal so that has not created a promise and he has not he is not bound by it okay so that's what we mean by acceptance having to be absolute okay so now what we have to look at is section 10 which is very important okay under section 10 we uh, you can actually use section 10 to kind of cover a whole range of sections and get a very good understanding of the whole uh, scheme of the uh, of con of the contract act okay especially of chapter 2 but the whole idea of uh, even this even including the interpretation clause okay all of these things are you can start from section 10 and it will lead you to all the other sections okay so <coughs> <coughs> section 10 says what agreements are contracts okay so if you go back to our overall scheme we said that all agreements uh, all agreements are not necessarily contracts okay so we said that right we said that because a contract is a species of agreement so all agreements are not necessarily contracts so therefore the question that arises when you're looking at any agreement okay is obviously one basic question is is this actually a contract or is it a void agreement how do i know whether this is enforceable or not okay so to answer that question you go to section 10 all right so you see section 10 here okay so once again i have kind of uh, heavily edited section 10 to make it easier for you to understand and what does section 10 say if you look at the structure all agreements are contracts if they are dot dot let's say um Let's put the dot dot here so that uh, now you can see. So what, the, what is section 10 saying? Section 10 is saying that when you are holding a con agreement and you are not sure whether it's an a contract or not or it's a void agreement, uh, what you have to do is essentially you have to 
check to see that it's setting up five filters you can think of it as five filters you have to see whether it passes the five filters okay so you can see these five filters now before we get into the consideration of the filters uh, the section is now you look at the punctuation of the section okay it is using commas what does it say made by one now one is obviously inserted by me free consent of parties comma competent to contract comma okay let's see what the i hope they've used the comma drafting is very bad actually and very often people don't use commas in the right places um yeah okay fine there's no comma but it's, it's still the same meaning okay same meaning as a comma this would have been better to put a comma there okay so uh, now what it when you look at can you see the five filters okay five conditions that have been set up okay now uh, when we are thinking about the conjunctives connecting these five uh, we can call these the five ingredients of section 10 okay so these five ingredients of section 10 do you think that based on the punctuation do you think that they have been connected impliedly uh, by the conjunctive or or by the conjunctive and everyone is clear that this is connected by it is clear to everyone that it is connected by and okay so that means what that means only one condition if we satisfy that's fine no all conditions have to be satisfied because the conjunct implied conjunctive is and all conditions have to be satisfied so when you are holding an agreement and you are trying to pass it through these five filters if you fail any of the filters that's it it's a void agreement okay you have to pass through all the five filters okay so now you can see how section we'll see now slowly how section 10 leads you to all the other sections of chapter 2 so you can start with section 10 notice that it has five filters okay so we are going to start from the back and we'll start with the, uh, the fifth filter which is not hereby expressly declared to be void okay this part is a little bit uh, we I, i'm just i'm not going to write arbitrary i think i've written it arbitrary is here okay so let's look at not hereby expressly declared to be void hereby what do you think hereby means what is hereby referring to this this expression is occurring in section 10 so when section 10 is referring to hereby what is it referring to yes further further sections yeah so it is essentially referring to anywhere in the contract act okay in hereby means it's not not necessarily in section 10 okay anywhere in the contract act which is declared to be void okay so we have to look at certain uh, sections okay we'll see uh, what we will we'll leave out section 20 from here we'll put it as part of the the first condition okay so the reason i'm saying this is arbitrary because it's not necessarily based on any kind of logic as such okay these are just things which are uh, i mean this is just my view somebody could argue that this is not arbitrary or whatever but uh, the point is these are just certain types of agreements which the legislature has decided okay we are going to make these agreements void okay so agreement and restraint of legal proceedings we'll see all that so not hereby expressly declared to be void means the legislature has expressly declared that these types of agreements are void period don't argue with me these are void okay so that's what they're saying so let's look at sections 25 to 30 okay if you look at sections 25 to 30 is the font big enough at the back okay yeah so you can see all these agreements okay uh, are uh, agreements without consideration as void generally that is the the principle in the common law there are certain exceptions here which are which are uh, you know limited exceptions carved out by the law okay so all these are uh, there are certain exceptions to all of these agreements and restraint of trade uh, then again there are certain case spaces where you have if you do uh, when you go for your summer training have you guys gone for your summer training not yet right yes. yeah so when you go some of you might be in hr departments you might be actually uh, looking at uh, employment contracts okay some of you might be drafting employment contracts so you'll see that some of the employment contracts for senior staff will typically have what is a non-compete agreement it will have a non-compete clause which means that this guy when he gets out of this uh, this name like vishal sikka once he leaves infosys he probably had a non-compete clause saying that 
you cannot work for an IT company for or in you know a certain classes of IT companies like maybe outsourcing companies like uh, this category of IT companies you can't work in an IT company for two years okay essentially to prevent that the use of Infosys uh, secrets in that kind of because he's privy to lots of all the information so, so these are non-compete laws some of these exceptions are carved out okay but these are limited exceptions but generally agreement and restraint of trade is void you can't have an agreement with somebody saying that you cannot sue me okay agreement and restraint of legal proceedings also void okay there is an exception in the case of arbitration because many of these agreements especially in financial services they have an arbitration clause <clears throat> so there is a dispute it will go to arbitration it will not go to you can't take it to court okay you can't take it to a civil court it has to be done under arbitration those exceptions are allowed under the law okay as limited exceptions but in general these are so these are all agreements which uh, the legislature has basically just declared as void okay i don't like it just these are going to be void okay so agreements by way of wager wager is just a thing which is where uh, you make a bet on an uncertain event where certain monies have to be paid or received based on the occurrence of an uncertain event okay so if I make an agreement with mr. X saying that if it rains tomorrow I'll give you five lakh rupees and if it doesn't rain tomorrow you give me five lakh rupees okay so this is just a bet that we are placing actually this is a this is what is called a wagering uh, you know agreement okay so this kind of agreement by way of wager under the law now what happens is suppose it actually doesn't rain tomorrow okay and I don't pay him the five lakh rupees okay let's say I was supposed to pay if it doesn't rain tomorrow okay then uh, in that case um, what will happen is he can't sue me because if he goes to try and enforce this in the court the court will say sorry this is a wagering agreement <coughs> again some lawyers also use the word wagering contract that's not correct because it's void so it can't be a contract so you have to say it's a wagering agreement you notice that the act does not make this mistake the agreements act says agreement by way of wager court will say this is an agreement by way of wager sorry <coughs> you we can't enforce this <coughs> so in this in like uh, in Indian stocks you know there is a system called Dabba trading I don't know if you had heard of this there is the system called Dabba trading where people just agree to uh, exchange the money is based on the loss and you know like if I buy Infosys at a particular price tomorrow it goes up by five rupees then the other party has to pay me five rupees because I've made a profit of five rupees okay so these are just trading contracts for differences these are also going to be treated as agreements by way of wager okay so these are arbitrarily declared by the legislature to be void so this is the fifth uh, filter in section 10 okay so that's section 25 to 30 so you notice how straight away you can notice how section 10 has made you jump to section 25 to 30 can you see that through the fifth filter in section 10 it has made you jump to 25 to 30 okay now go to uh, the, the third and fourth filter lawful consideration and lawful object okay I, have I explained the difference between consideration and object no I think not so object is a slightly higher level construct and consideration is a more micro level concrete kind of construct okay so I might have some kind of a uh, if I might enter into a contract to uh, like for instance I'll give you an example uh, from uh, uh, Donald Trump's life now you know that he has this estate in South in Florida called Mar-a-Lago right there is a which is which he calls the Southern White House okay so there was this property which is a very common tactic in the real estate business what happened was I think he bought he uh, in order to get this property for a low I mean I'm not 100% sure about the facts but let's just try to say there's a make up uh, let's make up a situation where uh, there is a particular property which you uh, which you are uh, you know desirous of acquiring okay in order to acquire that property what you do is you acquire the beachfront in front of the property okay this is a property there okay which somebody else might acquire maybe you don't have the rights to get that right now but what you do is you take the entire beachfront you buy the entire beachfront in front of that particular plot of land okay so what will happen is if anybody buys a house there you might build another house on the beachfront and then you'll block their view so it might spoil the thing so by actually buying one beachfront you're actually blocking uh, somebody else from buying the particular plot of land okay so this larger goal that you have of blocking the other person from buying that plot of land okay is your object okay whereas the consideration in this case is that you are buying your set shelling out a certain amount of money to uh, to buy just the beach front okay just the beach in front of the house 
that kind of thing it's not a very good example but i think you get the idea so consideration is a more micro level thing tied to the actual contract an object is a higher level contract which uh, a construct which is what is your larger goal why are you doing this okay because you want to block this other party from buying, buying this um, a particular plot of land you block anybody else because they know that if they buy it and they build a house and then you build another house then they're gone so actually Trump did something like that. I'm not sure exactly what he did but he sub did something along these lines to tie up this particular estate okay so uh, so this is the uh, meaning of consideration and object okay the object is the larger design behind the particular contract behind entering into that particular contract so once again you can see lawful consideration lawful object it will make you jump to 23 and 24 why let's look at 23 and 24 okay because 10 has already talked to you about lawful consideration and lawful object okay you guys saw all the five filters right yes, sir. you saw the five filters which is this free consent competency to contract and lawful consideration lawful object and hereby declared to be void okay so we are going through uh, filter three and four and three and four we notice that when we go to three and four uh, actually what does 23 and 24 say 23 and 24 defines what consideration are lawful okay what consideration and objects are lawful and what are not lawful okay so they have dealt with consideration and objects together okay and generally just to give you an idea okay and 24 we don't need to go into as such but we should be aware that 24 is related also if considerations are uh, unlawful in part then also they are uh, basically agreement is void even if they are unlawful in part okay but just let's look at 23 broadly the idea here is just that it should be illegal okay it should be forbidden by the law okay so what is not lawful essentially this is quite obvious it is forbidden by the law okay but there's one thing to be aware of here in under Indian law which is a bit of a problem here I'll give you my own view on the contract act and uh, the wording of the contract act but this is obviously commercial law okay this is obviously commercial law is very important for our economy now there is a pro point here you can see by and large anything that is forbidden by law or if nature nature that if you defeat the provision of any law okay or is fraudulent okay or involves injury to the person or property or these are all uh, these are all offenses already okay there is no need to write all this because these things are already forbidden uh, these are already forbidden by the penal code these things are all forbidden by the penal code so this drafting is actually a little superfluous because if you already said forbidden by law law means penal code includes the law is included in the penal i mean penal code is included in the law and these kind of things are already uh, made offenses under the penal code they are forbidden by the penal code so if you just wrote forbidden by law that would have been enough okay all this stuff is not required but now here comes the problem okay the problem is uh, or okay so or means now any of these conditions okay any of these conditions the court regards it as immoral or opposed to public public policy can you remember can you see how this is a lethal cocktail if you have a judge who believes in legal realism if you have a judge who believes in legal realism okay uh, if you remember i think i told you the story of a madras high court judge who ruled recently it's a related concept that if couples have sex then they are deemed to be married okay so uh, they forget about the hindu marriage act and the conditions that are stipulated there for de getting married okay the madras high court judge just declared that this is how it is okay so this is a very bad clause according to me it should not be there in our commercial law because it creates uncertainty okay there's no need to have this kind of thing in commercial law because a court a word, court regards it as what is court regards suppose i am a judge i think smoking cigarettes is immoral i can always say that okay so what is there to stop me so so you can't have these kinds of clauses in a commercial uh, in, in a commercial law framework okay or opposed to public policy okay we already have a very famous case in india or infamous case called ongc versus saw pipes where a judge basically declared a supreme court judge declared this court that this is that this agreement is uh, void because it is opposed to public policy according to me okay so public policy if you leave public policy as something that is outside the bounds of what is you know it's more than what is just legal so obviously what is forbidden by law you can't do okay if certain things are forbidden by the law then you can't do transfer of property act pro prohibits something uh, registration act prohibits certain things you can't transfer movable immovable property over 100 rupees without registering it these are all forbidden by the law that's fine these have been made by the legislature but public policy as used over here means something over and above what is written in the law 
So now I can decide that, you know, maybe running a business school is actually opposed to public policy. I mean, I can always find some bizarre way to show that, you know, maybe running a business school is opposed to public policy. So you can't have these kinds of broad things in a, in a, in a, in commercial law, according to me. This is very bad because it leaves it open to a lot of abuse by judges, okay, who are, if they are not particularly strict about the way they apply it, the law. Are you following my criticism? Yes. This is just criticism of the law. Like English judges, you see in England, there's a very good tradition of the judges are very commercially minded. Okay. They're very conscious of the importance of protecting commerce, not interfering too much about with freedom of contract. Okay. There's in, in the English law, there is a very good tradition of that, but we don't have that kind of purity of tradition in, in this country. You see judges keep flip flopping. So this is just something to be aware of, but you have to be aware that this is there. Any contract you have some judge who doesn't like it can shoot it down by saying it's opposed to public policy. Okay, so there is the Supreme Court has also actually opined about this that this is not a good thing to have. Okay, so um, I'm just going to rush a little bit because I want to wrap this up in this class so that uh, okay. <coughs> so lawful consideration now that the, the other part was competent to contract competency to contract. Okay, you can see who is competent to contract. Okay, age of majority. Okay, you should not be a minor. So contract law, we say that minors are not competent to contract. There is an exception for delivery of necessities and all that. Those contracts are not void. But in general, minors, any contract with a minor, any agreement with a minor is void. Okay. So age of majority should be there. Yeah. Is it void? Void ab initio. Any agreement with a minor, which is not covered by the exceptions, <coughs> void ab initio. Okay. Who is of sound mind? Okay. Now sound mind again will lead you to section 12. Okay, section 12, section 11. Uh, so this section, this third, uh, this second uh, filter, <coughs> second filter leads you to section 11 and 12. So you can see how each of the filters from section 10 will make you jump to the other sections. Section second filter is leading you to jump to 11 and 12. 12 is covering what is a sound mind. Because in 11 now you're talking about sound mind. So you have to define what is sound mind. That is defined in section 12. Okay. Now the first one, free consent of parties. Okay, so here section now free consent. We are going to the first filter. Free consent of parties. Now consent has to be defined in section 13. It's defined in section 13. And what is cons free consent? Okay, so I'll just take two minutes to show you the scheme. You can see how accurate the clock is. Okay, my alarm is very accurate. Okay, so I'll just show you the very brief scheme here. So free consent is defined in section 14. And you can see section 14 itself is making you jump to 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. Okay, so from starting from section 10, actually you can jump to all the parts of chapter 2 of the contract act, which is quite valid, uh, which is quite important. Okay, so please study the schema on your own. And hopefully in the next class itself, we will be able to go into the case. And I might assign another case just to be, I always like to assign extra cases so that we should never be in a situation where we have time but we just uh, don't have a case to to discuss okay so i'll give you another case when i go back okay all right guys you can go you have a question yeah. which is not working the sites are not working why it's working for me Okay, laws online, I think there's a virus right now. I just got a message saying by malware. So you use this advocate code, but you use the bear act that I've given you. I've given you a bear act, so use that. Okay, all right. I've given you a bear act, use that. Okay, yeah. Okay.